I'm going to take a page out of his book and uh, entertain the crowd with a series of questions. Um, but uh, so, what's the farthest uh, you've come to come to MAGFest? Like, who thinks they've journeyed the longest to get here? So I, I'll start. I'm from Queens, so I just took the Amtrak. What about you? Seattle. Seattle's a hike. <laughs> Seattle's not bad. Anybody from outside the U.S.? Canada? Yeah, we're in Canada. Oh, nice. Yeah, I think Seattle's a little bit more of a hike, you know, as West All Coast. Yeah. How those leaves doing? Yeah. Uh, come I see, mean, come saw. Uh, how those rangers doing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're in the same boat. <laughs> no, the leaves are doing pretty good now that they uh, they fired yeah. Babcock. Oh, so. true, Babcock's gone. So, um, yeah. So. Um, how many, I am, this is a very different question than when I ask it on, on your panels, but like, how many of you know who we are? Any one of the three of us? Cool. A bunch of new people. Yeah. <laughs> That's my line usually, oh, the rest of you are about to be really disappointed. Really disappointed, <laughs> no. Yeah, oh, sorry, put it right there. I hope we still got Just a few minutes, minutes, three minutes. So, um, yeah, for those of you who are like, know me on Geek Nights, this is not really my panel. I'm just a moderator. Yeah, I, I suckered logistics. him into doing it with me. He's, he's the one who's going to kind of ask us the questions, and we're going to talk to you folks about game development. And uh, I know a lot of people are interested in making games and starting their own studios. So I thought I was like, okay, you know, what is the kind of information I can impart, like, ooh, you should do this. This was a really good thing we did, but I would not make the same mistakes here. And, you know, just everybody has kind of a unique path through game development, but um, sometimes it's nice to, to get a little bit of, uh, you know, just advice and some, just hear a story of uh, a specific studio and how they got started. So basically, we're kind of going to ask each other questions and then you can ask us questions and hopefully learn something. I'm going to sit like a cool kid. Cool kid? Yeah. You're, you're sitting like the cool teacher and be like, now, I'm going to tell you, don't do drugs. Oh, we still got two minutes before the panel starts. Oh, no. And you've go to any concerts today? Anybody listen to any any good bands you want to recommend? We saw uh, what was it Ska Tune Scott. System? Yeah, Scott yeah, that System. was yeah, that was pretty fun. And uh, the what was the one before that? Soul uh, Brothers. Super Soul, Super Brothers. Soul Brothers. That was. Oh, nice. No. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hello. <laughs> but. Um, Yep, Proto Men, I think, start at 10. Yeah, and there's, what, what else is tonight? Power Glove? I think they go forever. I think Power yeah. is ending now. Yeah, I think that one was like in the intermedium between. So, yeah. But MAGFest is just such a great vibe because it's, you know, very equal parts the music and the games. I like that a lot. Um, We'll talk a little bit about how we found our music for our game, and that was kind of a, a fun story. So we still got like 40 seconds before the Stop panel it. starts. Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> Gonna do the countdown. <laughs> <laughs> We'll give it like one more minute and then yeah. we will begin. I can tell there's passion out here. You were here at night to talk about making <laughs> yeah. a game studio. What are you guys doing? You should be out partying. It's <laughs> so, MAGFest. And here you're here learning and listening to me tell you is like, oh, it's very important to have like a tax ID <laughs> number for your <laughs> studio. And you know, writing contracts is like a vital part. No, it's like, yeah, you should be up like in the, in the top where all the lights are and the bands are playing and stuff. So yeah, before we start officially, <laughs> one last question. Are any of you here because you want to make games or want to start a studio someday or join? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yay! <laughs> all I'll Live say the is dream. that over the years, because uh, I'm not a game developer, I just talk about how to make games, but <laughs> I don't actually make them. You're the, guy, you're the guy who stands on the sidelines and being like, maybe you do should it that do it way. like that. <laughs> but over the years, the people who are at panels like this, late at night at conventions, are the people who seem to end up making big games. <laughs> 
So, okay, so it's 10 o'clock, time to start the panel. Um, we'll, we'll do our talk and then we'll take a bunch of questions from the audience. So, th oh, you can't hear? Okay. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, we'll get a little closer. Yeah. Yeah, no, no worries. So, building your indie studio from the ground up. And uh, so, it's going to be some questions with us. And these are questions you can apply to yourselves and your own personal projects as well. So, um, yep. So, my name is Rim DeCoster. I'm just the moderator. I'm just here to ask questions, to provoke these two game developers <laughs> into talking about what they do. So, I'll let you two introduce yourselves because you work for a studio or the... run a studio called Windy Games. Yeah, so who, who am I? Um, my name is Emily Compton. I've been in the, game uh, the indie game industry in New York for over 10 years. Um, I graduated with a degree in film and television from NYU, like specializing in animation. And um, I've worked for numerous studios over the course of my employment. Um, one of the unique things that I think is relevant to this panel is of the three companies I've worked for, I've basically been in on the ground floor so I've seen the studios uh, you know in one case the studio is still around today and prospering and they actually have a, a game in the expo hall in the like arcade area and another one unfortunately went under and I'll talk a little bit about that um, and the third one is uh, started by this fellow over here. So uh, if you can talk a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm Adam Ashan. I am the CEO of uh, Windy Games. Uh, my background comes from, I got a degree in business from Champlain College, and I sort of took all like internships and extra classes for game design as they were uh, coming up through the school as I was going through. You basically like, you were a business guy, but you double majored because you liked games so much, and so you'd take as many game classes as you could, right? Yeah, it's trying to make a produce, producer role yeah. like, as I was going. So, you know, kind of in the intersection of business and games and economics and games. So. so, obviously that requires a lot of passion, like the fact that you have a specialty or degree in one area, but you're sort of moonlighting, like trying to get to the point of making games anyway. So, uh, where did that come from? Like, what really inspired you to make games? Like, why is this your passion, irrespective of your degree, as someone <laughs> whose passion and degree are very different things? And, and again, keep in mind, this is these are the questions that when you're thinking about developing games, you should start by asking yourself this question. Like, where do you come from? What is the background that m gives you this passion to want to make games? Also, like, what are the skills you can bring to the table? For, for me, I didn't actually think I was going to end up going into games. Like, I was interested in doing feature film, maybe television animation. I really like doing um, storyboarding was my big thing in college. But, um, you know, I had those skills that actually were very applicable to game development. And so, life kind of took me in that direction and I'm really glad it did. But so when when you first start thinking about your studio, then think like, who am I? What will my studio be like because of me? So who are you? And we'll start with, when did you realize you wanted to make games? Like, was there a moment where that happened? Was it just a slow evolution? Uh, I don't think there's a specific moment. I mean, since I was a kid, I wanted to make games. But back then, indies were not really much of a thing, so it was sort of like, you have to have a company to make them. <laughs> so my goal was sort of from there to, I need to somehow make a game company. <laughs> and uh, luckily, as I was getting through college, those indies started appearing, so I didn't have to go so uh, extreme for that. So I know you uh, you played a lot of like JRPGs and Japanese games growing up, and you had like a modded PlayStation and stuff yeah. like that. So did you ever think of like, ooh, I could go and work for Sony, or I could go and work for Square, or anything like that? Um, there was too much of I wanted to have creative control over what I was making. Yeah. So that never was really like the end goal. That might have been like a step, but yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to stay there. That's did you have a clear vision of what you wanted to make first, or did you just know you wanted to make something and then the vision refined from there? I guess I'd want to make something because I have so many like lots of ideas, like, right? Docs of like, oh, I want to make this game and this game, but there's not enough time to ever even touch that folder. <laughs> but that's definitely, like, that brings up a really important point of why you'd want to make your own studio. Like, um, you know, 
I have never made my own studio. I've been there at the formation of studios, but um, I like to lend my skills to other people's projects. And some, you know, when I'm doing my personal work, I like to have creative control. But if you are somebody who has a clear vision for they want to make something that comes from their heart and their mind, um, having the ability to form your own team and kind of structure your own company around those visions, it's, you know, making your own studio is probably the best way to go about that. So, what skills that you got from your degree, path, and your, like, education really came to the forefront first? Like, how did those help you get this going? Um, well, mainly it was all the, the business and producer stuff, so actually forming the company and just getting a team, getting contracts figured out, like finding the people I needed to do to make it. Mm -hmm. A lot of just the softer skills of just getting the team together and so things can happen. Yeah, there's, there's always kind of that gap between like the idealized, like it's the same way in art, like I'll always have like a picture in my head of what I want something to look like, but then there's like the drawing of the frames and the compositing of the render layers and stuff like that. And so really um, the HR process is, and the nitty gritty of business in the forming of the studio is kind of like that, that grunt work that you do in any endeavor to bring it from the brain to in the reality. So what skills didn't you have? Now we'll talk more about the details of like how to form a company and like yeah. all that stuff and like how to like how to put the team together. Like yeah. I need you, you're in. So what? I want the clicker. You want the clicker? <laughs> Thank okay. you. So what didn't you have? Like some indie studios will make like their own game, one person show. End to end. Was it that your vision couldn't fit into that model or that you lack some skills? Like, what was the difference between I'm going to make a game by myself and I'm going to make a studio to make a game? Um, well, the end goal was to have a studio and there is no way one person can do all the roles on like, a growing scale. Maybe if it was like one game, I could maybe eventually pull it off, but. I don't really have a lot of like the technical programming skills, mm -hmm. yeah. and it would take too long to sort of learn them all efficiently. So that kind of brings me to the point of, you know, that's the next question. After who are you, what do you bring to the table, it's why, and you've figured out why you want to make games. Why this particular project? Once you've settled on a project, like your first production with uh, your studio, why do you want to make that game? So for us, we're currently, Windy Games, the studio that we formed, is um, currently wrapping up production on its first title, which is Miasma Caves. It's this uh, adventure where a dragon girl is looking for treasure in these cursed caves, and the, the caves change every time you make a new game, and so it's all procedurally generated. Um, and it's, a lot of it is lore told through archaeology. So you're finding uh, hints to the, the past in this cave. And uh, so what made you start to design this game? You know, choosing Lasath as the main character, the story, the setting. Like, why did you, si and, and some of the design elements as well, why did you decide that Miasma Caves was a good first project for Windy? Uh, well, Originally, like, the goal is I have this massive world setting that I want all my games to sort of fit into, but the games those would sort of lead into are far too big for a starting project. Like the kind of big D&D world building <laughs> where it's like all the, all the different uh, fantasy races and all the historical events and cultural events in this world. And it's very hard to get that into a small indie game. <laughs> so, um, but how can you bring in that setting to a more achievable game as opposed to like an MMO or a, like a Final Fantasy type of experience? Yeah, I mean, no matter where it was, it's going to be like in the setting. So it's sort of just figuring out a game that's small enough and scaled that was achievable with our team. Yeah. Um, our team's only four people, so there's a bit of a limit on how much we can do. Yeah. And um, we sort of want to do one on exploring because 
Is this sort of is not really similar to what a lot of other things are? Yeah. Well, um, a lot of it too is is uh, from the game design aspect is the way you had taken elements from games you were interested in. It's uh, there is this is a little bit of an aside. There's a very interesting. Um, I, I believe it started out as a TED talk and then he wrote a book, but it's called Steal Like an Artist. And the idea is that it's not to plagiarize. Plagiarism is bad and wrong and you will get sued. But uh, uh, Steal Like an Artist basically means recognize and celebrate your inspirations. And you know, basically, you take in a lot of media, and you take in a lot of facts, you have experiences in the world, and you are adding all the things to your, you know, you're kind of like a blender. And then you hit period, and you make like the best smoothie that <laughs> represents you, and that's your artistic product. So it's like all these different artistic elements are going in the blender, and so that was something you did when you were coming up with the game design for this. You, you took like Minecraft, JRPGs, um, uh, what are some of your other inspirations that you were looking into? Um, let's see. For this one, I had a lot of like G um, roguelikes, so I had like Chocobo Dungeon 2, um, Minecraft was the obvious one. Yeah, the so, kind of exploring treasure hunting in a procedural environment. Uh, Dark Cloud was definitely bumping around there. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, but like then you yeah. go to the above world where there's a town with a bunch of townspeople that you can talk to. It's kind of anime inspired visually. And uh, so that's kind of comes from your, you know, talking to the shopkeeper and things like, was it Brave Fencer? Oh yeah, Brave Fencer, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, but like it's, it's very interesting because a lot of times we have these conversations where one of us will suggest a, um, an artistic or design inspiration but by combining them and taking them outside of their their context where they were originally created, you're able to create something pretty unique. Um, but yeah, like with the Minecraft thing, it's it's very different than Minecraft. There's not a big creative element. But like I remember you talking about the only thing you like to do was dig for diamonds. <laughs> no, it's more about like you have to go find a hole and then just explore. Yeah. And just not and just go keep on trying to find the diamonds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you just wanted to go down into a cave, and that was your main Minecraft uh, <laughs> endeavor. So it sounds like it wasn't just, I like these five games. It was, I like this part of this game. Exactly. I like yeah. this part of this game. Exactly. So that's, that's a little bit about, uh, about Miasma Caves. And uh, so we talked a little bit about this. Who will make this game? So obviously you're probably going to be one of the people, unless you're like executive producer and you're just like, I will give you a lot of money and make my studio and I want nothing to do with it, which I, I have a sneaking suspicion that would be like kind of a magical unicorn creature that every game dev <laughs> like wishes exists. If like, anyone out here. <laughs> venture capitalist, you know. Just saying, if any of you are an executive producer yeah. and want to just fuck Just give us money. <laughs> We would be very happy with you. Yeah, no, but like, um, like, that's, like, <laughs> like, that's like if you like in a lot of Kickstarters that see if you give X amount of money, you're just credited as executive. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk we'll about get that, into that. And like what those but titles and roles are. So anyway, you know you will be involved in the project, but chances are there will probably be some skills you'll be lacking. For example, you wanted somebody who could both draw in 2D, but also knew how to do 3D modeling and do animation. And so I am I kind of bill myself as a generalist. Um, I got my degree in 2D animation, but senior year I got really obsessed with Maya and 3D, because I kind of dragged my feet on it. I was like, well, you know, that's the way the industry's going. I suppose I shouldn't just draw comics all the time. I should get this 3D stuff. And then I just loved the heck out of it. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, those, those kind of things can take you on an interesting tangent. So, um, so basically, I know a lot of different elements of 3D. I'm not necessarily like the deepest knowledge in say tech art or rigging, but I have the basic skill set there. So um, I do art and you look in for some engineering work as well. As here, here are some of the basic, like I feel like these are some good baseline skills depending on your game. Like games are very wide. Um, 
wide medium and I think it's hard to say like if you're doing a board game <laughs> some of this is less relevant like audio but uh, we're mainly focusing on video game studios so I think this is like a good starting point um, so you are the designer I'm the artist we found two solid programmers and then um, audio and QA is something that we uh, we basically hired as a freelance position and we've done some of artistic freelancers as well um, QA is something we're, we're still trying to figure <laughs> out like you know who, who do we wrangle into like trying to break our game so how so. do you decide what you need a full-time person to work in your studio to sort of own and do versus what you trust a contractor or a freelancer or another firm to take a piece of like how do you figure out which pieces fit into which of those buckets um, well, I guess if something needs any like ongoing work, I'll probably want it to be like full time. Most of our freelancers are stuff where it's like once they're done, there's no real changing. So it's mainly been with like some of our extra art, that's like icons, because it's like something that's very discreet, and it's just like okay, we need an icon of this specific thing, and you can do kind of. Um, you know, instead of doing like an hourly or a salaried thing, it's like paid per piece, and we have like a list of all the pieces we need. So that, or, or audio yeah. is another thing, like sound effects. Yeah, like once they're done, like, and there's also just like a finite amount of that work to be done, where it's like, we're not gonna be able to keep going once like you, they finish those things. It's not like there's a big list past that they can do. Yeah, and um, I mean, in both those cases, like the icons and the sound effects, there was some back and forth, especially with the audio stuff. But um, one of the things that's kind of nice about having me in-house is that if you need changes, you turn around and go like, fix that, that looks <laughs> not good. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so um, I, I think that's, the other thing is in, in larger studios, often when, um, say if, somebody is an animator and their work on a specific project finishes they can be moved to another project even in some of the the smaller studios I've worked for like um, one of the first studios I worked at was Muse Games and I remember the animator um, it, Basically, the animator tended to have less work than the modelers, and so they ended up making um, a side game. It ended up becoming this game that's out on the Switch called Hamsterdam, and it's got like little fighting animals to keep the animator busy. <laughs> and so, ideally, you never have somebody with downtime. There's always a list of things. If somebody's full time, there's always a list of things that they can be working on and a list of things that they can do. So it sounds like for a, for a small studio, there's really only one project as opposed to a larger studio. So that's a very big concern. That fits the line of who is full-time versus who is contracted. Yeah. yeah. I definitely say that uh, that's a thing to be aware of is having a, you know, if you've got a smaller studio and you've got kind of limited resources, letting yourself get pulled in too many different directions. Mm. I think it's, um, you know, then you end up with like two half finished projects. I mean, sometimes that can work. It really depends, but um, I would recommend, you know, we, we talked about why this game. Have a this game, have a game you really want to focus on and go hardcore until it's finished and in a releasable state. Mm. Um, and so, you know, you, you've kind of uh, figured out the roles. How do you find these people? Um, I, I know that with me, I... Huh? GitHub. Well, for engineers, um, for me, I always tell people to go to ArtStation for artists. Um, there are other communities for uh, more uh, specific 3D specialties. But um, so, yeah, I, I tell people, okay, there's a bunch of portfolio sites. Um, I actually, one of the things I do is I, I'm on Twitter a lot, and often they'll have these artist portfolio hashtags, like visible women and um, like artists of color and stuff like that. And it will showcase the artwork of a specific demographic, but it's like all of the 3D artists and stuff in that community will start putting their portfolio links and their like renders and stuff online. And so you can just look at that hashtag and see like a beautiful wall of like all these artists who are open for freelance. Oh, for 
art. So. I've watched you go around artist alleys. <clears throat> yes. Me. Not just like <laughs> buying people's prints and everything, but taking the business cards of artists whose aesthetic looks good for either a current project or a future project, just to build a, to use an old finance, like it's a Rolodex. You're building the Rolodex that people in the 80s had. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw artist alley post complaining about people who don't buy anything and just take business cards. I'm like, that actually may end up being better financially for you because you don't know if that person is going to like send you an email and be like, hey, so we're, uh, it's, um, and it's also funny because I feel a lot with art especially, there's a very, um, very heavy networking element to it, like our, um, our character artist, who, like who does all the uh, 2D uh, character portraits, is an artist I worked with on, at an online magazine where I published some fiction, and I had like a bunch of artist friends, and I was like, oh, we should approach this person and see if they're open to doing commissions, and so sometimes that kind of helps. So um, yeah, for our engineers, I actually found the uh, like first ones from. Uh, the Unity forms. Yeah, actually, like, <laughs> actually, I came from the Unity forums too. Uh, that was <laughs> like just putting up job postings pretty much everywhere was the main like first focus because I didn't really have a uh, network back in New York. Yeah, it's hard when you're first starting out. I think like before you start going to the events, like um, yeah, like I was like yeah, I came from went to school in Vermont, so I knew the programmers I knew still were up north, so yeah. had to just find a, uh, after we found like our first few programmers, like after we had to get another one, like we just networking worked from there, because yeah. we had, like we went to events constantly and we sort of just met other people in the area. Yeah, um, so so actually uh, the most recent addition to our team who's been there for about a year, his name's Kevin, and um, it was actually my boss from the from What Pumpkin, which was a studio that I worked for um, doing cutscene animation, and um, I don't, does anybody know uh, Homestuck? Like, yeah. Okay. So, There's some very exciting there people. Was, yeah. Um, I really enjoyed, I, I worked on the Homestuck Adventure game, uh, Hive Swap. And um, midway through production, there was kind of a, a radical about face. And basically, they had put together a team from scratch in, in New York. And uh, I, I was doing, like I said, I was doing character animation. And they basically, right in about 10 months in, we're like, we cannot sustain a 3D production, we're gonna go with 2D instead. And so that team like switched over, but it was okay because I think the game turned out pretty, well, what came out of the game uh, turned out pretty good in 2D. But that's beside this, the point. I kept in contact with my old coworkers and that was a big thing. Um, I still talk to a lot of, I, I left both studios on, you know, different, but both relatively positive and friendly terms, and um, I think keeping in touch with the people that you meet along the way, I even if they're just like, you know, somebody you worked with on a contract for a few months can really bear fruit because how we found Kevin, the programmer, was my old boss, um, when he saw our job posting, he was like, can I tell my friend Kevin to apply? And I'm like, yes, please, you know? So my old boss kind of scouted people for us and it worked out really well. That's so. one thing to give a, you know, I work a lot also outside of the games industry and the way sort of bridges get built in games is much more natural and human than it is in a lot of other, other industries. Like friend of a friend throwing a job at each other and sharing jobs and sharing postings is much more common in gaming and I think it's yeah. cool that that's true. And I think that partly means that being in a place like this, like all of you should talk to each other yeah. at the end of this panel. Yeah, I mean, I, I joke around and say, oh yeah, nepotism is like really great. But it's it's not like bad nepotism, because I think bad nepotism is you hire somebody who isn't good at a job just because they are like your nephew or something. <laughs> but um, in my experience, 
making friends it in the game industry it's kind of like we all kind of help each other out like I will forward job postings to my other animator friends um, they'll do the same for, for me and um, I think one of the coolest things about this kind of close-knit community is that they do it, it helps when you're looking for a trustworthy and skilled person to work on your game um, I guess Going along with that, I mean, this is just a word of advice in general for life, is that don't be a jerk to people because you never know how that, that will affect you. Because I've had a number of stories where, where people will get a reputation in the, uh, in the industry and then like, yeah, you don't want to be known as that guy don't work with that guy, you know? So yeah, I think um, a lot of it is word of mouth, but also like job posting sites going on uh, Unity or Unreal or specific game development sites is good. Also, join your local game dev Discord. I think um, that's that's a nice one because then you might uh, might kind of uh, meet some people who are looking to fill in gaps in their team or are looking for work. Mm -hmm. So what comes first? This is a question for Adam because like, I wasn't there in the very, very beginning. Um, what do you do when you decide you're going to make a studio? You have to do some bureaucracy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You have to get uh, certain, certain legal forms and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, do you make an LLC or an S form? Um, we went with an LLC. And yes, that is the first thing to do. Um, is get registered as a business. Um, we went through our like, got an accountant who would help just set that up. I'm sure there's other talks that have gone way more in depth into that. So I don't think we need to do that here. I mean, the, the one I saw, they talked about the tax ID number and how to sell in a lot of places, like to sell on Steam, to sell on like basically any outlet for digital games, um, you need to have, you know, the ability to report that sales to the IRS. So, I mean, so in addition, addition yes. yeah. So, in addition, to just needing that for the actual sales, just being having separate legal entity is important for all your contracts. Yeah. So that way, banking. if if something bad happens, it doesn't hit you personally. It hits this other entity that you've created. It's kind of like a shield. So, yeah. So you did that. Um, you have a lawyer, right? Yes. So you, you have somebody you can talk to and who helps you make contracts. And um, the other thing that you were very good about is um, setting up payroll infrastructure. Yeah. Like you, uh, you hired a payroll company to kind of manage a lot of the business yeah. side of things. There's no, no real reason to do a lot of that like manually. So. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> it's like then you can focus more on designing instead of like making sure everybody's uh, health insurance paperwork is. Well, like in finance, the concept of build versus buy. Build the thing you're passionate about or the thing that's unique to you. Like the thing that makes your company or your studio unique. Nothing else matters that much. Just hire someone else to do it. Outsource it. Yeah. Buy something instead of building something. Okay, so you got that. So the other thing is, where will you work? So you've got your company, you've, you've done the paperwork and everything, now you've got to get down to the business of making games. So we're going to talk about a few things you got to consider about, like, so where will you do this work? Um, one of the things you said you struggled with in the beginning was, do I do a remote, like, distributed team where everybody's kind of working out of their own house? Or do I, you know, somebody's in across the country in California, somebody's over in France, or do I get everybody in the same room in like an office in New York City? And so you you decided to go with. Uh, I mean, I pretty heavily wanted to go with having everyone in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, it was a bit of a challenge because, I mean, where I lived at the time was not the most central to really anywhere. <laughs> well, like, are you talking about in up in White Plains? In White Plains, like near yeah. Katona. Um, <laughs> I, I actually didn't mind. White Plains, for, for those of you who don't know New York geography, is like a, a suburb city outside of um, New York. It's about an hour by train. Um, and so it was kind of funny because a lot of the employees, well, in the beginning, I feel like I was the only one who was living in the five boroughs. And then 
as we went on, everybody started moving to Queens. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, man, we're commuting to White Plains every day, you know. But the um, well, nice thing about White Plains is that if you're outside a major city, then you have lower rents in many cases. So that's, that's another thing to talk about when you talk about where are you going to make your studio. So say you want to get everybody in the same place and you have your local crew. Um, the city, I found, is really good because it's got so many resources for meetups, like the networking thing I was talking about. It's got that industry. It's got that community. But outside the city, a house is really cheap, <laughs> you know? There's like office space is not as expensive as it is in uh, Manhattan, shall we say. Though it was still pretty hard getting people who would like be willing to go there. Yeah. I do like interview people, but a lot of them just weren't willing to commute that far outside the city. Yeah. Um, so just... So sometimes what you pay in rent, you make up for in convenience. And um, so that's one thing. And um, we did have a few remote members of the team, but usually they're freelancers. Like we mentioned our icon artist, he lives in Russia. <laughs> so it was kind of like, but it wasn't work that required um, uh, real time. Like it, we didn't have any, okay, you need to be here from this hours to this hours. And there was a lot of back and forth communication. It was like a handful of emails once a week or something like that. So um, that's another where is that the remote team where everybody's in different time zones. Um, when I was working for Muse, uh, half of our team actually lived in Taiwan because it, the the um, studio was owned by a Taiwanese gentleman. And um, so we had the Taiwanese office and the New York office. And we had to be very careful to make sure all the problems and bugs and stuff got addressed in the daily call, which was like at the end of their workday and the <coughs> beginning of ours. And um, having those, um, the time zone differences can be a challenge to work around when you have a lot of back and forth in a team. So for you wrangling the studio, what are the advantages of having like everyone or most of the people in the same office? Like, what were the pros there? Why did you want that? Oh yeah, we wanted, we wanted that a lot. Um, it's just having everyone be present and just being able to just ask a question without having it to like, you email it, wait maybe like 10 minutes to an hour before getting a response for something that like you might be waiting on. Collaborative like conversations. Yeah, it totally. also just made like, yeah, like working on the same thing with someone, like, well, I can just look at your screen yeah. and we're done. Some, sometimes, you know, with, with art, you know, I'll, I'll be showing stuff to Adam, who's kind of like in the director role, and it's almost like a, if any of you guys have been to the eye doctor, where they'll be like, do you like A or B, A or B, kind of thing. But like, I can change things in real time, and it's more of a back and forth collaborative discussion than a, I present you my thing, and then a few days later, I hear back from you. Um, where we work now, we actually, there's there's two ways you can go if you're going to go f with an office. One is um, looking at real estate sites and taking out a lease, and that is not something I'd recommend for something as kind of, uh, that has as many ups and downs as game development. Commercial um, real estate is licensed in an amount of dollars per square foot. Yeah. It, and that dollar amount is a lot higher than you might expect. <laughs> So, um, especially inside, I'm, I'm talking from the perspective of somebody who's in a, a major city, but I would actually recommend looking for co-working space. And that's been a, a big boon, I think, to independent creators. Um, there's been a lot of bad press about WeWork be it from a corporate level, and I'm not even going to get into that <laughs> kettle of fish, but um, we, work out, we operate out of a WeWork in Queens, and um, I've had a very positive experience with it. And um, one thing that I thought was pretty funny is that in another, was it a green desk that's in Brooklyn, Gumbo? Oh, yeah. Where <laughs> there's this one co-working space, it's a green desk in uh, the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn, where a whole bunch of independent game developers, like, and like mini studios and stuff got together and they all went to the same co-working space and so it's almost like a 
a game developer commune or something where they all like help on each other's stuff. And it's if you can get an environment like that, like um, there used to be a co-working space in New York. It sadly shut down, but it was all animators. It was called the Productive, and so it was like people would give each other freelance work. And so you're not paying for your company on an like just you it's like there's also other people around you and there's like possible collaborators and maybe QA testers and stuff <laughs> so yeah that's that's like it gives you an idea of the little little glass office that the four of us uh, four of us work in every day so when will you work this this is a shorter one, and um, it's kind of like, are you going to do full-time or part-time? And uh, so you decided to hire the main yeah. staff as full-time. Yeah, um, like with like the scope of the game is what we were doing, like anything less than full-time would have taken a very long time. Um, yeah. And given that it's like yeah. employees, like and. Like, and we're actually like a full team. It's like, it makes more sense to do that. I think like if you're gonna do part time, it has to be sort of like you and everyone else has to know each other and yeah. we sort of agree that this is what you're working on in your spare time. Yeah, it's um, I've seen a number of projects which even if they're paid, they can kind of fizzle out because life gets in the way, you know. And although I do still recommend game development as a part-time job or a part-time like hobby type of job you know it's like your side hustle and um but if you're to the point where you're like i'm going to start a studio i am going to do it as a business um then i think it might be good to look into actually if you have the resources to pay somebody a living wage, have at least your base uh, personnel be full-time employees because then they'll be focused on the game. There won't be like, oh no, my day job is in crunch and so I can't work on the game all month. So, um, but for a hobbyist game, that's perfectly valid. The same, same thing with the remote teams. It's like, you know, if you're doing it for fun, then do it in your evenings and do it in uh, in the weekends, and I think that's a, a good thing too. Ah, <laughs> that's the kicker. How will you hire? Like, if you're going to hire these personnel, how will you pay for it? Which gets back into part time versus full time. Yeah, a lot of hobbyist games or even like small studios. One or two people work full time and then work on the game part time, and the full time money pays for the part time work. Yeah. Depending on the scope, small games that could work, but obviously your your aspirations were bigger here. <laughs> yeah. So, like, what are some of the funding models that you can consider for making a making a game? Um, crowdfunding. Um, like Kickstarter a, and Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Yeah. Uh, investors. Yeah. Um, any self-financing, which... Yeah. That's another thing with self-financing. Um, don't, don't be, uh, like, embarrassed about the idea of, like, using... Like, if your family or relatives give you money, it's like, if you've got it, why not put it to work making games, you know? Well, we were um, at, what, the, uh, the Game Devs of Color Expo a few yeah. years ago, and one of the panelists talked about how especially if you live in a major city, you might have some friends you hang out with, like you play games with, but they might be quietly, like not rich, but well off, <laughs> and possibly also very interested in gaming. And they said that they were surprised at how many people were willing to throw them a little bit of money to help a game come out. I mean, we even invested in our friend's studio. Like, it wasn't a huge amount, but it was like, you know, it helped him keep his servers up for this, his first game. It was a visual novel. That's why, I, despite being a podcaster exactly. and like a product manager, I am technically an executive producer. There we go, <laughs> bringing back the executive producer. But like, um, and again, there are pros and cons to these models. You know, um, going with a publisher, for example, you, you lose some of that creative control we talked about in the beginning. You know, you, you start your own studio, you make these things. Once you start, um, you know, basically getting money from a third party who's kind of controlling your marketing of your game a little bit, then it's um, a little bit of that control 
goes away from your your particular studio. Um, and like with Kickstarter is another thing. Um, the second studio I worked at, the one that closed that I talked about and that worked on the Homestuck game, um, that was entire, it was one of the biggest Kickstarters at the time. You know, Homestuck was a massively popular webcomic and so it's um, it made like two million dollars or something. And through a variety of uh, there was a lot of <laughs> a lot of things that I can't get into and don't have time to get into, but that money didn't go quite as far as they expected it to. And since they kickstarted it, there were already a bunch of people who essentially bought the game, who were waiting and kind of knocking on the door, being like, "Any day now." <laughs> so uh, you know, that's that's one of the downsides to crowdfunding is you have this audience, like you have this built-in audience, but sometimes it's like, "Oh no, I have." this built-in audience and so um, yeah so think about that before you start your studio and as you're starting the studio like where will the money come from and you need money up front it can't just be like I'm gonna sell the game and then the game will make money it's an investment there needs to be money to sustain while you are producing the game so a kind of specific question, where does early access fit into that? Because that's a relatively recent phenomenon where you can sell the game before it's done and sort of also get some playtesting out. Like, are you doing early access? Have you seen pros and cons with that? Has that helped fund the game? Um, yeah, we are doing early access. Um, it, the goal is to help it sort of fund the game a bit and give us an early audience. Um, Mainly, it's been helping us actually do a lot of testing and sort of just get feedback. Um, yeah. It's been like the main benefits from it for us. That's that's the big thing is like as a small team, we have trouble setting aside time for like the core to do QA testing, and so we like we need other people to see if they can break the game because I've got to make the ZBrush model right now, and um, having it be like okay. That's not the only QA testing we do, but having it out in the broader world and people are like playing it and then they say, hey, fix it, um, that's been pretty helpful in letting us know where there are problems with the game. And then one more specific question, how do you go through the logistics of budgeting and sort of projecting like long-term plans and burn rates and all that, like do you do that yourself? Is that something you would hire an accountant for? Um, I've been doing that myself, um, I mean, Part of it's sort of like, well, you know everyone's um, salaries, so you can sort of base off of that. Um, and then you sort of, or like, well, we set up, we had a timeline of what we wanted, how, how long we wanted the game to be done, and sort of set to go there and then put a very big buffer because you will go over time. It, it doesn't matter what you're making, you will go over time by like, quite a lot. So. <laughs> this is true in, in art as well. It's like when I, I'm learning as I get older, when I give people um, like estimates on how long something will take, I'm almost too optimistic anyway. I, I was like, instead of telling them how much you think it's going to take, like double it because nine times out of ten, it will take that long because there will be something that you didn't anticipate. So yeah, I, I think the probably could be, same could be said with the schedule overall of your game. So yeah. And this is like kind of a, a simple one. This is maybe once you start getting your artists and your your engineers involved, you're, you've got your team together. You know what will be the uh, the software and the the technical tools you'll use to make the game. And so that was something we kind of settled on early on. Is uh, I'm going to show you these are these are my programs basically. These are the programs that I use, uh, the software that I use to make the the game. Um, I'm a Maya user, and you can see like I sculpt characters and. ZBrush and then I'll retopologize them. Um, Marvelous isn't like the biggest thing, but like I really like to use it to make character clothing um, and Photoshop. But um, one of the the main things to do is decide what engine you're gonna use for your game. And if you say I'm gonna make my own engine, please tell me you have a really good reason for doing that, and or that instead of making a game studio, you want to make a software company that makes a game engine, because that's also valid, and that's cool. But if you have a pretty simple indie game project, and you're like, and I'm going to make my own engine, unless your game is very specific, 
go with Unity, go with Unreal. There's so many nice options out there that can uh, facilitate a lot of the, uh, the technical side of your mm -hmm. game production. So and, why uh, did you choose Unity? Did you choose that before you hired engineers, or did you hire engineers and then decide based on like looking at spec documents? Um, they were about the same time, but part of it was at the time we decided uh, Unity uh, still had the, their certain pricing, but Unreal still was very expensive. That's right. Unreal is more recently uh, started courting the indies. Yeah, now that, now they have a much better revenue like model, but at the time it was 30%. Yeah. And um, for that's, this, a, chunk that's, of change. A, that's a lot to go with when Unity was charging like a thousand five hundred a seat per year. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. So now Unity they're better is now. Free. They're, now they're about even. So, but <laughs> at the time we sort of got locked in due to the costs. Yeah, and I mean like um, we have an interesting situation with the procedural, like the procedural generation aspect of the caves, is that we basically have a, a three-level engine. It's like we have Unity, we have a plugin called Terrain Engine, which is kind of like a voxel engine that goes and works with Unity, and then that lacked a lot of the features we needed, so we added a bunch of uh, proprietary stuff on top of that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is with, especially with an engine like Unity, there's a lot of plugins and assets, especially like art assets you can get, and I want to tell you kind of like there are pros and cons to using a large amount of stuff from the asset store. Like standalone art elements are actually pretty good for um, for indie developers, like especially if they're ones that are like just a prop that's going to be in the background, it can save you a bunch of time to like no one just says, buy. Oh. <laughs> that's that chair I saw. I saw know? that chair in Skyrim. I can't mind this game now. <laughs> but but you know, if it's something that isn't like super necessary to be like absolutely unique, or you could put your own spin on it, you know, I think you should buy it from the asset store. It will probably save you a lot of time. Um, the thing I caution against is using a lot of plugins that are really essential to the functioning of your game. Like either have it be like, okay, I'm going to depend on this plugin a lot, like Terrain Engine, which causes us uh, its fair share of issues, especially with upgrading and stuff. But if you have too many plugins, it's very difficult to keep them updated and to make sure everything plays nicely together. So I'd say use them on the fringes of your project and use them to like create assets Sets and to create things, but like sometimes it's it's dangerous to have too many things. Yeah, we ran into a few problems where some of our uh, plugins stopped getting updated, and when we had to update Unity, they just we had to remove them completely. Yeah. And then well, figure out a solution around them. It was more that like a lot of our architecture had been designed around these plugins, and like you know really needed these plugins to function. So it required like a massive rewriting of the game's architecture. So, yep. So back to build versus buy. <laughs> yeah. Build the important parts of your game. Yeah. <laughs> and here's here's a quick thing I just want to talk about real real fast is like what do you want the game to look like? You know, as as the person who's who's started the studio. I'm assuming you'll be kind of in a directorial role like Adam um, and you know this is this is something that we talked a lot about starting um, for starter you wrote a document and said I want it to have an anime aesthetic and this these are sketches that were uh, by a friend of yours a long time ago yeah. exploring the character of Lasath um, so have an anime aesthetic have kind of a, a you know, JRPG, uh, PS1 type yeah. of feel, like very saturated graphics and stuff. And uh, here's here's the final model and uh, the character portrait by Rem. And here are some of the other characters, you know, dragon people, townsfolk. Um, but you can kind of see how 
you know, we kind of made sure we don't go for realism. I, I kind of uh, pushed you. I was like, oh, come on, let's do procedurally based rendering, which is like, you know, making sure everything has like, you know, metallic and shininess. It's basically the new kind of shading model that's in Unity. And so I was like, yeah, let's do it cartoony, but let's have like metalness and stuff like that. Um, but so we kind of had a compromise between the old school PS1 JRPG and the modern Unity stylized art. Here's some of the other stuff I made for the game. Just a bunch of assets, and you can kind of see what we're going for in terms of the uh, the blending of cartoonish and, and PBR. So how much of a give and take is it between game director, designer, wanting things a certain way, head of art, like designing art based on your designs, and then like the back and forth feedback loop. How does that work in a small studio? It's it's a collaboration, right? Sometimes I yeah. go, sometimes I get stubborn, I go, no, I don't want to do it like that. I think we should do it like this. And you go like, no, but I want it like X. And like, most of the time, like, we'll, we'll come to a compromise. And often the compromise looks pretty good. And like, we take the best of both, you know. And uh, sometimes I, I, I say, no, I don't want to do it like that. And then I come back the next day and be like, no, you're right. I think that probably will work better, you know? So I, I think it's just like any sort of collaboration, like a, a, writer, a writer and their editor, or that sort of thing, where they're, I can say personally, sometimes I'm stubborn and I have pushback on my work, but like really what it comes down to is trying to get everyone in the studio on the same page, or at least everyone in the art team on the same page, and being able to communicate that that um, that overall vision to every member who's going to be working on the visual style. Uh, here's here's some screenshots. These are some recent screenshots. It's a little dark. You can't see the the cave stuff as well, but you can see her like in the crystal cave and up in town, mooching around. <laughs> so what did you learn? Um, let's see. Like, um, like, what challenges did you encounter and then you learn something in overcoming them that'll make the studio stronger or make you stronger? Um, well, one of the big challenges early on was just hiring and getting like the HR stuff. I think just getting through it all and being able to network like, as a studio since then has just helped me make a network which just lets me gather from there instead of having to start from scratch every time. Not knowing people. So basically, Make friends, I guess, and then and then hiring people becomes easier. And then right? uh, scope. Scope. Like, I, as much as I thought the scope was low, it was still nowhere close to being as low as what I was expecting. That's a, some features just could have, took so much longer; it had to be cut. When, I, when like thinking of them, I thought like this should be pretty easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> And then it wasn't. That's the thing. It's like no matter how simple you think your game idea is or your art project is, it's probably more complex than you anticipated. And so I think that's a good lesson to take away is just to, you know, to expect that things will be, will be bigger than you think. And I, I think this probably kind of ties into the same thing. Like this, these are like a little bit of a postmortem. I mean, the game isn't out yet, so it's not a postmortem. But like, you know, it's it's things that we've kind of thought along the way. For me, I, I can talk about my biggest challenge. Um, being a generalist, this is the smallest art team I've ever worked on, which is an art team of one. So I had to learn a lot of skills I hadn't used in the past. Like I needed to learn how to do environment modeling really well, and like terrain. Um, I had never made a terrain before and so it was like learning to you know doing the uh, height maps of that and um, a, a bunch of different software packages I didn't know and so my biggest challenge was being able to gauge how I would accomplish a given task but also budget in the time to learn that task. I think my biggest challenge has been just trying to wear so many different hats. Yeah, you like, definitely you definitely have a lot of different roles. Yeah, I'm trying to you do are busy like, man. be producer, marketer, and designer. Yeah. So it's just it's a lot of things to juggle and just sort of figure out well when do I have time to do each one and be able to like change my mindset so I can actually do them when like I'm trying to do that task. 
And so what would be your definition of success? That's the last question. Like, think about that too. You know, when you're making your studio, go into it being like, what do I want to accomplish? Like, what do I want out of this? And like, again, like I said in the beginning, don't go into it being like, I'm going to be a billionaire and make the <laughs> next Fortnite. It's like, mm, I think your expectations might be cruelly crushed by that one. But, you know, what would be your success for the studio if you wanted a, a wish, you know? Um. Be able to do well enough that we can make the sequel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To be able to continue to make games in this same same line. That fits, it fits back to your earlier thing about how you're, why this game, you have this broad vision, you had to make the first piece of it. Yeah. So clearly the goal is to make the next piece. But a smaller, like I've seen very small studios where their goal was just to make the game to be their portfolio to then get a job for a larger studio or make a studio themselves that was bigger. Okay, so that's that's our panel. If you would like to ask any questions, we have a few minutes. Yep, there's a microphone right up here. Yeah. We have about five minutes, but well, they'll try to answer your questions. Yeah, and we, any questions we don't get to, we'll we'll talk to you out in the hall. <laughs> Thank you for all the information. <clears throat> yeah. Wonderful moderation and beautiful graphics, Emily. <laughs> Thank you. Rim, great job on the um, turn-taking panel last night. Oh, <laughs> um, the question I have is probably more directed at Adam. Is um, At what point did you validate your idea for the game, at least validate it to the point where you said, I'm going to sink time, effort, and money into building a team for it? And, and have you validated that? Uh, even if you did it after you hired the team, how did you know, like, this is it, I feel confident I'm going to move forward? Um, I had a lot of like, game ideas I had planned, and it, I sort of got to the point where like, I was doing other jobs that weren't really game-related. like related. I was like, it was time to stop just preparing and just figuring out what the plan was to do and just, just pick one and just make it. So I picked one with a scope that I thought was obtainable of like the ideas I had, and I just started fleshing it out more while I started looking to make a team and get the business done. Um, thanks again, and um, going back to the question of like who to hire, I guess maybe a little bit, um, how are you approaching uh, marketing, and since marketing extends into social media these days, also how are you approaching um, community management? Um, marketing has been one of our biggest challenges. Uh, it's uh, hard. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, currently, we have moved to, like, we just hired an external marketing team, and we are working with them to sort of come up with a uh, new strategy. Like, we've been trying to do social media the past few years, just doing regular posts and stuff, but as, like, we didn't have a following to begin with, and I don't have, like, a big following outside of this. It's like, I c just gathering the initial people has been very hard. Yeah, getting that critical mass for social media is really tough. Um, I think with, like I said, um, well, like you said, we, we hired a, a marketing firm. So there are teams that uh, specialize in indie games, too, which is kind of cool. I got a question about um, like prioritization because you mentioned uh, Adam mentioned uh, wearing many hats and having to do all these different roles. I'm kind of in the same boat right now, yeah. uh, trying to figure out how to get like my team off the ground. It's just me, so um, not really in the same boat of I already have a team and got to prioritize. But anyway. Uh, how do you prioritize what to work on? Like ver marketing versus designing to get something in your portfolio you know, versus getting the networking together. What's your priority uh, chart look like? Um, let's see. So for each part like of uh, production, we sort of had like, here's our goals for like this sprint. Like I'd sort of break it into sprints and stuff. So like for like this couple months, here's what like the main focus is and sort of keep that going. So early on, just like hiring was like the main thing. So that was sort of where all my energy went to. Like once the game was underway, sort of like sit, put like, all right, I'm gonna put like one day a week or one day every other week to sort of just work on like media marketing posts and have those like ready throughout the week. Um, and then it sort of let me focus the rest of my time on the more immediate stuff. And if anything is sort of like, is 
necessary to be done before something else. That just has to jump in the way. So you basically schedule your time. You yeah. say, okay, from from this day to this day, it is design time, and then you go, yay, it's design time, and then it's like from this day to this day, it's uh, write people emails time, and you go, boo. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so. When I don't do that, it's really hard to change the mindset like multiple times in the same day to the point where like. I'm trying to design. Why am I trying to write an email? So you, you do all your HR tasks and then you do all your design tasks. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so just real quick, uh, we actually have a small studio. We both work full-time jobs and then do it part-time. We are friends. I t completely agree. We have, to have that agreement ahead of time. Um, my question is, we have software. We've got a nice vertical stack. Um, we kind of know what like our sales need to be in terms of like success for us. Um, and we're looking at giving it out to alpha testers and they uh, hopefully the idea is that they will generate content for us so that ratio of like how many you know we need a lot of sales so like how many how many you know alpha testers uh, would be like a good idea like as many as we can get so as to then blossom this you know the the software and the, the um, user generated content such as to have this springboard or is there like uh, you know any kind of thoughts on that um, my thoughts are like, if you have enough where you feel comfortable for like enough people to actually be able to see it, then I would go with as many as you can, because more content will just generate more people, I feel. Yeah, I, I feel um, like visibility is indie games' main hurdle in many cases, and so I feel like without visibility and without friends talking to friends about a game or a property, uh, there is no sales, <laughs> so I think just you know spread it around. <laughs> but just like be prepared for the amount of like emails and just forum posts and everything that you're gonna get because it's gonna be a lot. <laughs> Even with us, we have a few dedicated like early adopters, and they are very very uh, <laughs> very involved. <laughs> and so it's it's good. <laughs> So we're just about out of time. I think we can get through everyone if the questions are quick and the answers are quick, and the two yes. panelists will probably be willing to I answer will further outside. questions yeah. right outside this room. Absolutely. Uh, so we'll make it yeah. snappy. Okay. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much for that. When it comes to designing the game, do you design it all up front or like an iterative process where you do a little bit, you test it out, see how it works, see if it's better or worse, tweak it from there? Um, for this one, I had everything planned before I hired. Um, now, that's not to say a lot, of, uh, most of it didn't change as we went. Sure. But I had like the guideline and then I sort of had like the, this is like the core idea of the game and then there's a lot of things I added on on top, but that was very subject to change and could be removed if there just wasn't time to get it done. Yeah, we had a massive game design document to begin with when I started, but like we ended up having to cut features and some things were just changed because of technical limitations or just because they worked better. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Hey, so um, I work as a QA tester as my day job for a game studio, um, but we're here at MAGFest with a team in the Indie Arcade, and um, we've been working on a game with like experimental controls, and we've been really trying to figure out, I, I've been really trying to figure out as well, like how do we take um, the time that we use, like um, our spare time nights and weekends, like you were saying, as our like passion project, and take that as to something we can use to self self-sustain ourselves. We're trying to work on the visibility by being here at the Indie Arcade, which has been helpful, but we still don't have like a way to like get ourselves like to that level. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, visibility is something that we're also trying to figure out. I mean, part of the reason I was like, I, I like to do panels, and so I was like, oh, I, there's a panel I can do at MAGFest. And, um, but that's also partly because I was like, hey, come and, and do this panel, we can talk about our studio. But, um, you know, so I guess I, I don't really think that there's any one answer to like, I guess if you see an opportunity, take it. So being at a place like MAGFest, like joining discords, also like 
even if it's like your local library wants to have like a festival or something like all sorts of things where you can you you think you have the time and the energy to take your project I mean go for it cons are a little hard because it's like they require a monetary investment in many cases and also like with the hotels and the transport and stuff like that so but you know kind of weigh those options but yeah I, I what do you think um, I think like we have our, our local communities like play crafting that really help because oh, they, ho they host like regularly monthly meetups where and a bunch of kids just, come <laughs> yeah a bunch of kids come people can see it and yeah. it they charge the like, the devs and they don't charge any of the, the audience to come so you have a lot of people to just to see how it is yeah all right, thank you. Yeah, but is, check to see if you have like a play crafting or the equivalent in your local local scene. Okay, awesome. I will. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I believe you talked about this in a more general sense, but if you don't mind me asking, how exactly did you receive funding to start your company, specifically like your your company, and how do you continue funding it? Um, most, like it came from a lot of like self funding and family and then we tried to have like early access help yeah. finish it up. So it was kind of like um, basically personal investment and then uh, put, huh? Oh. Oh, time side. <laughs> time side. Okay. So we'll be happy to answer the questions yeah. outside. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to I you. I hope this was an enjoyable panel. Yeah. Uh, 